It's a good win. There's a lot of people. It's like Woodstock, except everybody's got their clothes on. But eat a damn snack. You're like my wife when you get in space. You just get lost. Shit! Short steps are better than long steps. That's the only time in your life you're going to hit short is better than long. It's the middle of the week, but it's the best day of the week. Welcome back to 614 Headsets. We're your host, boys. Say hello to everybody. How we doing? It is. I keep giving the countdown now. Let's do the math stout since you're not that good at math. How many days we got to the clinic, brother? Three. <laughs> Look at his. Did, did you see his arm twitching? Yeah, his twitching because I was counting on my hand. You're right. You're right. I see that. I love it. But, dude, three days to the clinic. I cannot wait for this day. I'm, I'm excited for the podcast tonight. Great speaker, great guest, great person that's been a part of my journey. Saturday is going to be elite. Yeah. Appreciate you guys tuning in, uh, getting some Twitter Twitter interaction, too. Like we said, we're excited for tonight's episode and even more excited for what's coming this Saturday. Appreciate all you guys that have signed up, that are interested in coming, that have shared the message. We're, we're really excited for what this is turning into hey tom brady said it best football is unconditional love we can agree more we're three high school coaches from the 614 area it's this game is a lifestyle we consider our show and what we're doing a movement that lifestyle make sure you subscribe to the show please subscribe on any of your audio platforms you listen to subscribe to the youtube channel we've talked about the clinic walk-ups are still welcome for this saturday we're going to be at cohatch polaris east the pub if you want to come in person. Also, if you just can't make it, if you want to uh, pop in for some of the talks, we're going to be live streaming the entire event on our YouTube channel at 614 Headset so you can hop in and maybe get some football done that day. But give us a subscribe, give us a retweet, give us a uh, a rating or things like that. Those little things, I need you to pull up your phone. I need you to do that. It really helps us grow and really helps us with sponsors and things that we're doing. Also, there's a new home for 614 headsets. If you go to www.614headsets.com, we have a new home for our show where you can see uh, relevant news. You can see X's and O's. Something in season two we're starting is The Lab, where we're going to bring you some X's and O's content about uh, football junkies and things for next year. All of our episodes on there, you could literally hop on and stream the audio or stream the video. So please check out the new home. Like I said, 614headsets.com. We can't wait for this show as we get into it today. Today, we're going to have Coach Riser. Most of you probably know from Tiffin University, but now the head coach at Gardner Webb University. We're going to get into talking about the first 100 days. What do you do when you take over a new program? And it's that first 100 days on the job. And it was a great talk, and I can't wait for everybody to listen to it. So subscribe. I hope to see you all Saturday. Enjoy the show. As we get rolling today, 614 Headsets is proud to be presented by Fundraising University. Fundraising University Ohio offers a variety of fundraising efforts that helps football teams run profitable, effective, and fast-paced fundraisers designed to raise the most money in the shortest amount of time to reach their fundraising goals. Fundraising University Ohio is locally owned, operated, and with their six-step blitz system will help your team maximize profits. As a current coach himself, Brent Maxwell with Fundraising University will sit down and help you pick, plan, strategize, and execute your fundraiser that will allow you as a coach to focus on your practice time, prep time, player development, and personal time. If you're interested in us running a fundraiser for you, please contact Brent Maxwell at the letter B Maxwell at fundraising, the letter U dot net or 740-501-8946 to learn how you can get started with fundraising. Man, we're pumped up today. We got a great guest, one of uh, the best coaches I've ever been coached by or, or been coach, been around in this coaching world. He took care of us at ODU, made sure we re broke records every week, I felt like, on our offense with Coach Reisert at the helm. Coach Reiser, I'm going to introduce you and correct me if I'm wrong on any of these things, right? I, it's a long list for you. But Coach Reiser's an Ohio guy, right? He went to, he graduated from Moeller, 
uh, Cincinnati Molar. Let's add that in there so that they know that they don't get disrespected there. He's an Ohio Dominican alum, which he was also inducted into the Hall of Fame. He was the national NIA, NAIA player of the year in 2007, two-time All-American at Ohio Dominican. And then he was inducted in 35 under 35 in uh, 2021. And his coaching career goes way back to ODU starting, right, at, at ODU at 2011 to 12, then Ball State offensive line in 2013. Elon University at 2014 to 2016. And then obviously the record setting offense that he brought to Ohio Dominican from 2017 to 18 got him uh, to be able to go to Tiffin, right? And, and be the three time GMAC coach of the year. And all three years he won the conference. Coach Reiser, go ahead. You can go ahead and follow that up on whatever you want to say or introduce yourself. I'm good, man. We can end the podcast and call it a day and I can go <laughs> home. No, that, was, uh, that was beautiful, Ryan. I appreciate that. You mentioned the success we had at Ohio Dominican and really the success we've had anywhere. And it's so player driven. And so appreciate the opportunity I had to coach you and, and the other guys that were on the offensive side of the ball and defense side of the ball. And you realize that you do this long enough that none of it's, none of it happens without tremendous people around you from a staff perspective and amazing players. And so you're a, a prime example of that. So I appreciate the the awesome introduction, but it's it's because of you and, and, and all your buddies that, that got a chance to have all that stuff ring true. And Ryan now, didn't help that offense at all. But he, yeah. he gets started. I think Come it's on, really, it's, I yeah, think it's fun. really important as we think about a coach's introduction. Way to go, Ryan! But hey, I think we got to let our, everybody know that's tuning in. Coach has now just been taken over as the head coach of Gardner Webb University. So, congrats on your new job, Coach. For everybody tuning in that might not know that. And like I said, Ryan did not help you in any of those categories. Never. Hey, look, I'm going to tell you right now that <laughs> Coach Reiser definitely did not like me when I was on the defensive side. No, I wouldn't say Coach Reiser. I, I would say his quarterback at the time, one of my best friends ever, Grant Russell. I'll never forget getting in his head a little bit too much at practice, and he uh, blocked my number for the whole week. But Coach Reiser also is one of the guys that got me uh, at, at Pick North, man. Without Coach Reiser, dude, for real, I would have never started coaching. He was the one that told Coach Hiller to go ahead and take a chance on me. So I feel like I'm forever in debt to Coach Reiser and what he did for me to be able to start my coaching career and kick it off. And I just greatly appreciate it. But, Coach, talk a little bit about Gardner-Webb for us. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate all the all the, the intros and all that stuff. But, yeah, I've been the head coach here, got the job. Middle of December, been a uh, total whirlwind. It's an amazing place. But I had time previously in North Carolina when I was at Elon University, and and that we left in 2016 to go back to Ohio. And we always said, my wife and I always said, if we ever had a chance to go back to North Carolina, we would really relish that opportunity. And when Gardner Webb uh, came about, and I had a chance to talk to our president, talk to our AD, get a sense of the alignment and how driven they were and how how urgent they were to be successful in everything that they did. I, that really attracted me. And then you get down here, the place is beautiful. The campus is amazing. Academically, it's a top-notch place. And, and the resources are here to be really successful from a football perspective. As hard as it is to leave a place that you love, like Tiffin, that you invested so much time and energy in, and my family, into the community and the university, it was a, a really awesome opportunity that you really couldn't pass up. And I think we have a unique opportunity to really build some amazing things down here. That's perfect. We love that. So, Coach, we got to get right into our segment. This is our favorite, my favorite segment. It's the Pick Six segment, and that's brought to you though by Story Rivals Media. Championships, friendships, and life lessons are among the most meaningful part of the athletic competition. We are passionate about preserving them by offering the most unique highlight experience available. Story Rivals Sports Media delivers your team's content with services designed to change the way you experience these unforgettable moments. Now and for a lifetime. Story Rivals now offers a complete team apparel and player shop customizable to your program. Please contact them at uh, email info at storyrivals.com to schedule an appointment with a member of their team today. They do a good job too, Ryan. I will say that. Like I've seen some of their stuff and mm -hmm. uh, they do a really good job telling the story of a lot of high school teams. Yeah. And so it's been, it's been nice to see. Hey, hey, I tell you what, we're really excited to have Aaron and his team on board. And I think the really cool thing that Aaron and his team is really going to do is show all the amazing things they do on top of the digital content. We yeah. sat down and talked. It was everybody knows them for the digital content. And then you start diving in and talking about the apparel side, the jersey side, the team side, the fundraiser side, having somebody that designs clothing for them that also still works at Under Armour. Uh, I think Aaron's going to make a really big push this year, and he's a perfect partner for us, and we're excited to have him on board. 
uh, and he's going to be at the clinic Saturday. So make sure mm-hmm. everybody come and you, you make sure you talk to Aaron and, and see how you can up your game in, in 2024. But coach, <laughs> this is the pick six. You don't know what's coming at you. We got six questions. Uh, we're going to go round robin here. And I think Ryan's going to start it off. I'm definitely going to kick it off. So first, let me ask you, what's the number one food joint down in Boiling Springs that you've hit so far? There's a place called Pleasant City, Pleasant City Grill. Really good pizza, good salads. It's a good spot, good local brews. So yeah, it's a solid joint right here in Shelby. There we go. Go ahead, Donnie Mack. I love it. So maybe it's a little too early, but the question was, how has NIL affected recruiting at the FCS level? Maybe how do you anticipate it? going forward do you see any kind of wave that's coming on um for you guys coming through is it still a little too early to tell yeah i mean i think the wave is here i think the wave is hit i still think our level is protected a little bit in the sense of if if it's a completely money driven decision and you have the opportunity to probably be at a higher level you're probably going to do that where we've capitalized at least in the short term is on guys that hey i was at the higher level i didn't maybe have the opportunity i maybe didn't have the impact i maybe didn't have the playing time that I wanted when I played at the power five level when I was getting X and now I just got to play. I just want to play ball. I want to have an opportunity to put film on tape and show what I can do. And so we're not so much NIL driven as we are opportunity driven. That's the way that we look into it. If I'm getting into an NIL battle about a kid, I'm probably not going to win that battle, right? Because likelihood of somebody having deeper pockets at the FBS level is probably pretty true so for us it's about opportunity it's about vision and what we can do to help them for the next level and also academically to help them continue to improve it's refreshing to hear in a different age of college football honestly like where we're at now it's very refreshing to hear that yeah i think we're i think we're protected a little bit because it's at our place it's that's really what it's been like we're very clear up front look we don't have money for you you're not gonna have to pay anything to go to school you're gonna have an opportunity to capitalize on a great education but if this is a money driven decision, it's just not the right place because I just don't want to waste my time. You know, it's, but if it's a decision where you want to come and prove something and you want an opportunity to sharpen your sword and get tape and hopefully be developed in the right way and play winning championship football, then we can talk. And so I think it's protected our culture a little bit by bringing in guys for the right reasons. And we understand that there's times where we might lose out on some talent because of that. But I, just, I think life's too short to be around guys who don't love ball and don't want to do things the right way and be about the right things. And we're fortunate where I have a staff that's on board with that thought process. And then I got a really great group of guys, man, that it's still, it's about the brotherhood. It's about doing it the right way. It's about finding a way to win and, and having a lot of fun doing it. And I think that's interesting to hear that retake. And I, I did Donnie about being refreshing. Cause when you think about coach Pratt, who was on earlier when we did a special NIL episode, he said the same thing about the need for, finding players that fit your culture not necessarily going out and getting people just because of nil and it's interesting to see how people are now reacting what are we in the year two year three now of this situation the different positions and strategies different programs are taking Uh, but i will say though donnie i don't want to hear about nil in this program for the next month because this has been (laughs) all nil like that's why i'm so excited for coach's episode tonight all right so (laughs) Coach, I'm going to keep it a little bit more lighthearted. We just got done with two major holidays, right? And when you think about candy, I'm a candy guy, right? Which, in your opinion, is the worst or would you rather have least? Original candy corn or an original candy cane? That's a great question because both are terrible. I really truly agree. (laughs) When you think about stock candy (laughs) around the holidays, you had to pick one that is the worst of those two or the least you'd rather have. I think probably candy corn. And then I would flip it on its head flip it on its head and say, what is the best candy bar? What are the three of you? Which what's your top candy bar? You gotta have one. It's gotta be fast. Coach, I'm gonna agree with you right now on the the candy corn. It's terrible. That's such uh, a bad choice. In candy terms, corn is fire. In, yeah, that's why you're trash. In terms <laughs> of the best, I gotta tell you what, we try to keep this this show PG, but back in the day I had a ritual. And when you went out on Friday night, Saturday night, and you had a good night, you reward yourself with a Gatorade and a Snickers. No doubt. Coach Sayers, what's your poison, brother? See, here's the thing. You, I, I don't really like candy bars. I'm not that type of cat. I'm a Sour Patch kind of dude. You know what that's I mean? I like candy. If you're the a gummies sour guy, like that, fine. but bro, look, we know you candy. like the gummies, Ryan. Yeah. All right, all right, relax, Kyle. <laughs> yeah. PG, right? I don't want to hear about that. No, but I will say that I love candy corn. And Nerds came out with the most fire Jeez. candy corn this Halloween. 
And now my wife goes and buys it on Amazon for me to make sure I got my candy corn in the house. So I got to disagree with you guys. And then I'm going to send Coach Reiser to pack of this candy corn that's made from nerds so that he can get hit. I look forward to I look forward to receiving that goodie back. Yeah. I'm with Sayers on not being a big candy guy, not on the candy corn. That was nasty. When I was younger, I always loved Three Musketeers. That was my favorite like candy bar out there. I don't know what it was. It was just my favorite. This is a super healthy podcast. I'm really <laughs> impressed with you guys. We, you guys are crushing protein and salads <laughs> and all the above, right? So all the good brain food. That's right. Besides Stout, you you don't ever you don't see him without his hoodie on anymore. That belt's a little big. Hey, man, dad bod, two kids under three, and I'm surviving. But all right, Sayers, question two from my man. Question two, Coach Reiser. I'm about to put you on the hot seat real quick right here, okay? This one's going to suck for you. Who's the – you're probably the best quarterback to walk through a high Dominican. Who is the number one quarterback that you have got to coach in your time coaching? Uh, it's an awesome question. I, I, I really, truly, I know this is like a coach speak answer, but – so many different guys for different reasons. For instance, Mark Miller was the first guy I ever recruited. He was a tremendous player at Ohio Dominican, and he, from the early phases, different rhythm to him. He just had a tremendous ability to lead. He had a tremendous confidence. Uh, there was just a steadiness to him, and you could tell that he was going to be so good. That was the first commit I ever had, first kid I ever recruited. And uh, so I, I always remember him for that. And then you had, as a coach, right, Grant Russell, my first year as a coordinator, who was a dynamic dude and ended up being an All-American that year that we had him. And uh, what was just big and strong, you could make any throw on the field. And then third and two, third and three, fourth and one, you knew who was getting the ball. So there was like just a, an ability to make plays in big moments that Grant had. And we had a kid that second year at Ohio Dominican, Evan Ernst. Yeah. Evan was a redshirt freshman. We had him, ended up leading the country in passing efficiency, leading the country in completion percentage. And he was so incredibly smart and accurate. Like he could process information like anybody that ever been around. He's going to be a lawyer. So it makes sense. Right. But 4.0 kid. And you could tell him one thing, he'd write it down and you'd never have to tell him again. And then not only could he retain information, but he could process it really quickly. So he was like a computer on the field and he could feel things and see things. And that's why he was so effective. And then it, at Tiffin, we had a kid named Nick Watson, right. Ended up being an all American at Tiffin and the thing that about Nick is like just a complete alpha like leader and the most competitive guy I've ever been around like never lost you could do competition drills in the offseason didn't matter who he was going against when it was happening what the situation was Nick was going to win like irregardless of anything when that rubbed off on the team and then this past year we had a kid named Casey Martin and he was a tremendous leader and he was a tremendous servant leader and I learned a lot from him just about watching uh, players lead players and what that looks and felt like and, and he really helped me grow as a coach, just understanding like what it looks like to hold guys accountable from a servant perspective, not so much a demonstrative perspective. One of the things I thought he was so good at was like when guys weren't meeting the standard, it was never, hey, you got to meet the standard. It was, hey, you and I both know you're not meeting the standard. How can I help you meet the standard? And it was, how can I serve you to help you get to where I need you to go so we can win? And, and we can do it together. And so I've had, I've been lucky, man. Like I've coached some great dudes, um, some great quarterbacks, good people. I'm probably missing some. We had Keegan Ray was our backup that played the last five games for us and tip in this past season. And talk about a kid that's 160 pounds soaking wet, but tough as nails, competitive. It was fun, man. Yeah, I've been fortunate. I think, like I said earlier, we've been successful because of our players and uh, I've been able to have a small role in them just putting their their own stamp on our offense and getting out of the way and letting them create and be themselves. And it's been uh, worthwhile to watch. I, I was hoping you would just stick with Mark Miller so I could get on Grant. I was going to text him right after that. Like, no, I would never do that. better than you. <laughs> I would Because I know exactly what you would do. So I, I you already knew that. that. I, I never, never misses an opportunity. opportunity. I love yeah. Grant too much. I'm not doing that. But I love them all. They all were great in their own right. <laughs> that's awesome coach i got my second question for you this came up someone asked me this the other week or so of your coaching now like where do you get your inspiration or inspiration for your style of coaching from and you know, i had to think back to high school coaches i had to my college position coach is there a coach from your past whether it was high school or college or one that you coach with that you draw your style your inspiration from of, of how you talk with players or how you lead a program how you coach a certain position 
Yeah, it's a great question. I think you pull it from everybody you're around. Like I've always prided myself on trying to be a sponge when everybody, I've been really fortunate. Like I've worked for some awesome guys. I've worked around some awesome guys, worked with some awesome guys. And, and I feel like I've taken so much away from each person I've been with, whether it was coach Carlson, who I played for was fearless and that rubbed off on me. And then coach Conley was a tremendous recruiter and a tremendous organizer. And he could get anyone to buy into his vision because he believed it so much to his core. And, and coach Lembo, was as organized and analytical and thoughtful about everything he did. There was a plan. He was playing chess and we were playing checkers. And just the ability to be intentional about every choice that you make as a program and then being one step ahead of everyone else as a head coach, I was like, man, this guy's really amazing. And so I took that away from him out at his level, but you try and take small things. Work for Coach Skrowski and he was a tremendous analytical football mind and one of the things from him is like he could disseminate information from a football perspective better than anybody i've been around and he could pick things apart and find issues with them and then solve them as as well as anybody i'd seen and so much of what i do from a, a thought process perspective offensively and defensively of how we analyze things and how we think about things and how we make adjustments and capitalize on things that we're seeing drive from him. Coach Signetio was fortunate enough to be around him when he took over Elon. So I got to see a takeover, a transition that was invaluable, as good as anybody I've seen in terms of bringing structure and discipline and accountability and making the kids buy in fast, elevating it, instilling confidence and getting guys to believe right away. Coach Cummings, I worked worked for him at Ohio Dominican. He was so good. I felt like it at, at building a, a toughness within the program and, and really challenging guys every day to bring an edge to what they were doing. I thought he was great with that. Yeah, I, I, to be honest, I think with leadership, you, you pull from everybody but you have to be yourself. And, and so I wouldn't say I've taken my voice or how I would address the team or how I would interact with the team. That's just who I am. It's my genuine self because anything other than that, I think is the, the guys see through pretty good. But I think you learn some something from every stop you're at and, and it helps helps create who it is, uh, you who you are at that point in time when you become a head coach. And I still pull back from like lessons of, of back in the day that I, I carry with me and they help shape you for sure. But I think you have to be real and genuine about who you are and how you address the team. That's a great answer. Stout, you're last, right? Yeah, I'm last. And I got a backup question because I don't, I don't know. Uh, coach, are you a reader at all? Do you find yourself reading in the off season? I do. Yeah, okay, I would love it, to read more. But I'm but with you. So then this question is going to roll. So I'm going to roll with it. At the start of every new year, I feel like I get a lot more motivated to read something. Every offseason, I try to dive into something maybe from a football perspective, a biography history perspective, or a culture, self-help type thing. I even got Ryan. Ryan even came to the house and borrowed a few books, and he's diving into a couple good ones right now, and he's going to trade some back in. But for me right now, I'm reading uh, Disciplines of a Godly Man. If anybody's looking for a good book, it's a great book that kind of smacks smacks you in the face as a man right now in, in the new world. If you're trying to be a good man as a father, or even just today, I'm trying to finish up Chop Wood, Carry Water. And I got Row the Boat my wife bought me. But I don't wanted to ask you, though, what is one of maybe the best books you've ever read about maybe culture, self-improvement, leadership that you have on your list? Yeah. I've done all the John Wooden books. I we do a I have a pyramid that we use and so I'm like I'm a big wooden guy. I love Kaizen. When Kaizen, yeah, that's, Kaizen. Um, that is that I, that's so I'm big into that. We have a he's just cause you mentioned he is a daily devotional. Mm -hmm. It's like a 60 day devotional that, that you do each morning and, and it's, there's scripture to it. There's, there's a, that piece of it, you get like his thoughts and then you get the biblical aspect of it. And I, I do that each morning. I actually, before I left Tiffin, I gave it to one of my players as he was dealing with something. So I gave it to him just to use each morning as a way to balance himself out. And I haven't been able to get another copy. So I'm like, I'm itch, I'm, I'm I'm struggling in the morning now because I don't have that anymore. But that was something that I used each day. That's been big for me is like just something in the morning, every morning that gets you in tap with what you need to do that day and centers you out. Um, and But I, I love, I don't know if you've read the talent code and culture code. They go back to back, but I think I don't even know who wrote them, to be honest with you. But those are really good. It talks about the different cultures of the different of some of the great teams that have come in the past and why they came about. And then the talent code is unique. And it talks about basically if you look at 
there's certain parts of the world that produce the greatest at whatever it is, right? So why do all the greatest soccer players come from Brazil, right? Why do why are there the greatest baseball players from a small little town in the Dominican Republic, right? Why does it happen? How does it happen per capita? It doesn't make any sense. And so it dives deeper into what drives talent, what drives production, the ignition, the things that go into it. So I think all those things that talk about like pulling out greatness in everybody is really interesting to me. But I would say daily devotional, being able to tap into being ready to rock and roll for the day, have a spiritual component and, and get centered. That's where I would start. I'm going to throw one at you, coach. If you haven't read it, I'm a big believer in a lot of Tony Dungy stuff. And I love Wait. a lot of stuff he's wrote. Have you read the one year on common life daily challenge? It's unbelievable, right? Yeah. yeah no it's doubt. great. Um, and so I, if yeah, you're looking for I that's a great one. Anybody that's listening, if you want a yep. short, one pager morning get your mind right framework that's, great. that's a good one too no doubt so. no, that's a great one he all his stuff is unreal he's he's, he's talking great. about a, a godly coach a guy that did it the right way like that guy's a dude so yeah. yeah i would recommend him for sure i'm just surprised when ryan asked me about books that he could read ryan asked me for hey. books my first response was you can read i i told that i was like i'm starting to read right like we we did for church we did a we did a big full overhaul man like we were, were we gave a lot of things up for this uh first month and that was the thing for our church like i haven't had you were talking about candy i haven't had a piece of candy i haven't had a soda an adult soda too i haven't had one of those in since the, the beginning of the month and then i was like you know what let me just start reading i got a pl uh, plenty of time on my hands if i'm not drinking sodas i made sure that i grabbed some books from them and i told i was like it's crazy this is about to be like the first book that i've read before and he's don't tell nobody that yeah. Dude, don't, don't tell people i'm like hey smart <laughs> notes is a hell of a thing in college. Hey, we all got to start somewhere brother i'm yeah. proud of you. i'm just proud of you. that's the pick six segment brought to you by story rivals let's get into this main topic Coach, we talk about the first 100 days on a new job and really the background of building what your vision, what your culture, what you want it to be, what it was, whatever, you know, previous stops, how to, carrying that vision and that culture over. And so we have some questions just for you, because again, like Coach Stout mentioned, this is it's a perfect topic, I think, for tonight's episode with you. And so one of the questions I had, or Stout, I think, but it's a great, it is a great question is what are some of the first things you do the moment you take a new job? What does that process look like for you as a coach? What does it look like as you talk to the team? What does it look like as you're building your program, building your roster up to the to begin to get to the levels that you want it to Yeah, no, I think, I think this is a, this is a super loaded question. We could, we, it's good that we have all night to talk about this topic because I think, I think a lot goes into where you're taking the job, right? Like, What's the situation you're walking into? What's the environment you're walking into? For me, early on, like so much of it is just evaluating, learning, understanding the environment, meeting people, getting around the university and talking to different people, understanding the processes. Every job you take, there's different processes, right? How to get people hired, um, how to get people computers, right? How to get people online to certain databases, how you get keys, how you get key cards, right? There's all these little things that people seem to forget about, but they're so important for people to be able to come in and do their jobs. But I think in the short term, I think you have to think people. I think you have to think about who's my staff, right? Who's going to come with me? of the the place that i'm going to is there anyone there that is still there and if they are do i know them do i know someone that knows them do they fit my vision and my culture and are they going to be the right type of guy that's going to be someone in line with me do i have somebody at the position that they coach what does that kind of look and feel like and then i think you dive into the player part of it right where it's all right who's there how do i connect with them how do i connect to the people in their life that matter one of the things that that we try and do is you know certainly you're connecting with players but you're connecting with families too and and so it's all right let's connect with with this young person right and learn about them and learn about where they're at in in this state of transition right talk to their family learn about where they're at in this state of transition on college football in today's world right there's a transfer portal now when coaches leave there's typically a lot of turnover at every place you, you're going to take over it's just the nature of the beast and so i think it's evaluating where you're at evaluating of the guys that are in the portal is anybody interested in coming back and are you interested in having them back what does that look Look like and then at that point once you have a full understanding of where your roster's at you recruit and you go and dive in to find guys that fit your vision and fit your culture in terms of the first team meeting and things of that sort 
I think in, I think it's the old adage, right? Is you only get one chance to make a first impression. I believe in that. I think, I think it can be really powerful. I think you have to be intentional and thoughtful about everything that you do and every, in, in each way that you do it. I think you also have to be super intentional and thoughtful about every aspect of the communication part, right? If you're not going to call player A, but you did call player B, how does player A feel? If you're going to call player A and B, then what's that say to player C? And so players talk, right? They're perceptive, they understand. And so just being super thoughtful and intentional about everything you do when you take over a job, it's easy to get caught up in the whirlwind of everything. And it's harder to just have that checklist of, all right, I got to handle this and be super methodical about it. And I'd like to say that I've gotten better at it. I don't know that I have, but I've tried to be more intentional and methodical as I've taken over a job like Garner Webb to make sure that we're doing it the right way and not getting swept up into the emotional piece of it. But from a team meeting perspective, to me, it's your first opportunity to sell your vision, your first opportunity to make an impact and build relationships. And so for me, I'm always going to get there early. I was I'm there 30 minutes early, meeting everybody, shaking hands. I'm not like I'm going to walk into the room in a grandiose thing and say, hey, everybody listen to me and this is what we're doing. And I've learned this. You have an ego and you go in that way. To me, it's, it, maybe that's who you are, but I've always felt let's do it the right way and build from the ground up and get to know guys. Because the one thing I would stress as you take over a new position, like none of the kids in that program have probably asked for it, right? They didn't ask for you to be there. They didn't handpick you. They didn't get a chance to select you out of all these guys, right? Like you got thrust upon them. And so to go in and, and hellfire and brimstone and say, this is exactly how we're going to do it. You're either in or you're out. To me is not how you manage this situation. I think you have to have empathy that these guys are dealing with a lot of transition. There's a lot of emotion. Some of them don't have a sounding board at home to be able to figure out what direction they go in. And so I've learned just to have empathy, to evaluate and listen and learn and find a way to connect with guys and to be a resource for them. And by doing that, it's allowed us to build really realistic relationships and allows us to start as fast as we've wanted to. I love that you brought it. You said you did going through like a checklist. Did you build one before you arrived in Boiling Springs? That was going to be one of my questions. Did you have an actual checklist that you're like, okay, day one, I got to get this done. No questions asked. Day two, I got to get this done. Yeah. Yeah. I, I typically have a first day on the job, second day on the job, first week on the job, second week on the job, first 30 days, and then first basically three months and six months. So you have things that you want to accomplish. And then I say that, Ryan, and then it's all craziness breaks loose, right? And everybody's got a plan to get hit in the mouth kind of thing. And, but I think just being prepared for the inevitability of the craziness and being able as things are going crazy, you can get back to your checklist. Hey, oh shoot. I didn't talk to HR about, so right. I didn't go visit the police officers, right? I didn't go to the local businesses. I didn't uh, check in with campus ministry. I didn't get a chance to connect with the band and the cheerleading coach yet. And so you, you figure out where you missed the boat a little bit, and then you try and find time carved out to go and find the things that you need to get done. I could imagine that, is, that checklist just keeps getting bigger every time. Like you go back to it, you just write more things down. You do. And then it's, and then the key is you, know, you have to self-select and self-edit, right? Where it's what's really important here when in the beginning phases, like it's staff and players. And, and then once staff and players are set, it's processes, right? What are the processes that need to be put in place? What are the things that we need to evolve or modify that are already pre-existing? And then what are the things that we need to completely stay on path with how things are done? And so the one thing I've learned when you take over a new job is you have to over-communicate, communicate up the chain, communicate down the chain, like just communicate. Don't be in a silo. When I first got the job at Tiffin, I was like, all right, here I go. And you're just rolling and you're doing all these things and you're crushing all these things or you feel like you're killing it. It's like, oh man, I'm doing all this awesome stuff. And I remember the first month I was there, I had this fundraiser and did a fundraiser and we raised like 15,000 bucks. And I remember our AD called me and he was like, Hey, did you do a fundraiser? And I'm like, Oh, this is, he's going to love it. And I raised all this money. I killed it. And, and I'm like, yeah, I did. He's, you realize that our national giving day was two days away. If you had raised that $15,000 in two days, which you very well could have imagine how good that looks to the entire university and not just the football program. But it wasn't malicious. It was just me not communicating and saying, Hey, I'm doing this. Is this the right time to do it? And getting that checks and balances underway. And so I've learned that when you take over a new situation, ask as many questions as possible over communicate, because if you don't do that, then it's really hard for people to earn, to, to learn to trust you. But if people are very aware with what you're doing from a daily basis and what you're doing from a thought perspective, from a thought perspective, they're going to 
gradually begin to trust you more because they know what's happening on a daily basis and they know that you're trying to keep them involved. And so um, I've always been really keen on over communicating early and honestly, like my whole like over communicate all the time because anything that, that gets left unsaid is left up to thought and you don't want anything left up to thought. You want everyone to be very clear about where you stand. I really like this. And when you think about people listen to us, a lot of the guys that listen to us are a lot of coaches or enthusiasts of, of football, but a lot of guys listen to us are probably very excited or enthusiastic about being a head coach someday. And so I think one of the biggest things that I saw when I was a younger guy trying to put together interview materials and put myself out there for a job, uh, one of the most impactful resources an older coach gave me was a checklist of what to do right when you got on the job, right? And that's what this first one, 100 Days, is about, right? You go back in history, it dates back to FDR, talking about how to fight the Great Depression and what he was going to do. And then ever since then, it's become this standard of we evaluate presidents on their first 100 days. And that's why it's so important to you as you're in your first 100 days. And if you're a younger coach and you know, soak in what coach is saying now, reach out to some older guys who have maybe taken over programs and have been through this a couple of times before. And they're going to really help give you a blueprint and a checklist. And that's what I love about of coaching is it's so relationship driven that guys are willing to share things and help others succeed. And so if you're a younger guy, I really suggest if you're interested at all in becoming a head coach or climbing a ladder or doing better, even preparing for your next job, you might be a head coach now at a smaller school and you want something larger in the future. This is one of the most impactful resources you could have, both from an interview perspective and from setting a foundation to even have success in the future. And that's what kind of gets me to this next question, Coach. When we talk about Tiffin, I'll say it as an Ashland man, Tiffin used to be terrible, all right? And you don't have to say anything. I can because I'm undefeated versus them, so it's okay. <laughs> I used to even joke on guys, hey, we're running out of cannonballs, guys. You got to stop us from scoring, okay? <laughs> but I'm not going to ask you what it was like when you first got there, but I think I'm just going to ask you, were there a couple strategies that really work there? And when was the turning point? Do you remember a point in time that it was, okay, I see the success, I see this as the turning point, when did you maybe feel that we've gotten to the top of the hill to the success? Because before there hadn't been the championships and the kind of winning at Ohio and, and, and that type of a thing. Yeah, I think you know, it was five amazing years. It was, it was a place that I learned so much about being a head football coach and so much about just taking over a program and being able to go through some of those ups and downs. I had, a great athletic director that I worked for and Lonnie Allen, and he was really instrumental in just helping show me the ropes a little bit and what it looks and feels like. And I'm always uh, grateful for that. Um, and, and I think, I think more than anything, so it's funny you mentioned like guys trying to get a job and, and all that stuff. I always feel like it was a God thing for me and, and really in every place that I've been, but it's funny, like when I was getting ready to interview with Tiffin. I was an offensive coordinator at High Dominican. And I remember as a coordinator, you have all these different ideas. You have like 80 pages of stuff, right? And it's everything from every coach you've ever worked for. And it's like, all right, we're going to be tough. And we're going to be relentless and we're going to be amazing. And it's, you have all these different worksheets that you got over the point of your career. And it's like, all right, this is all my stuff, right? It's like, how the heck are you going to sell that? How are you going to create continuity to a vision? And then more importantly, how are you going to walk into the president's office or the principal's office and sell yourself and what you might have as a 10 minute window? How are you going to do that succinctly to get your vision and who you are through that you get the job? And so I'm sitting there, I was at the Ohio clinic and Neil Brown, who's now the head coach at West Virginia. I honestly had no, I had, had no, I didn't know why I was at his talk and I was just randomly just stumbled in and he pops up a pyramid. And he talks about their culture and there was a bottom rung and all that stuff. And I'm like, the light bulb goes off. Boom. That's what I need. That's how I can sell who I am. Genuinely, my culture, the things that I care about, what I want our program to stand for. That's how I can sell it. And so I went home and I, I remember I DM the GA in West Virginia. Hey, can I please have this pyramid? Because at the Ohio Clinic, sometimes you can't take the picture if you're far enough back. And I had the old cell phone at the time. So I took a picture of it and it was super blurry. So I'm like, shoot. And so the GA in West Virginia DM me his pyramid 
And so I went to work when I started thinking about, man, what's, what's my belief system? What's my priority order, right? What are the core values that I want my program to be about? And I grinded it out for a day when just, just scratching and clawing and just figuring out like really, truly, who am I, right? What are the things that I believe in that I want our program to be about? And I worked really hard to create that. And you had talked about coach about like going different places and culture, like to me, Every place is organic, but the culture that we preach and that we talk about is genuine to me. It's what I truly believe and it's the things that I practice in my daily life. I think that was a really big turning point for me, like getting the job and, and being able to do that was having that pyramid, being able to sell a vision very quickly and very shortly. But in terms of being able to go there and turn the thing, honestly, man, it was relationships and effort and, and daily process, investing in the players every single day holding each piece accountable every single day, investing in the players every single day. It becomes a very big fabric, a part of who you are and as a head coach. And if you are a head coach, like it's not a job, you don't turn it off. It's it's every minute of every day of your life and, and your family has to be involved. Your family has to be all in. And mine, mine has been, like I said earlier, my wife's a, a, a complete rock star and none of this happens without her. And, and so that's how we were able to do it. I wish I could give you more black and white, but honestly, like we just built relationships on every level, every single day. And we worked, I think, harder than everybody every single day. And I always said, as a coach, my job was either to earn trust or lose trust each day. And my ability to be prepared, my ability to hold guys accountable, to build a really concrete structure and to make sure that it was everything we did was intentional and thoughtful. And our players knew that there was a plan behind absolutely everything we asked them to do. It got them to buy in. And in terms of when we got a turn, I don't know. I really felt like, you know, after honestly the first year, I think going into the 20 season, we were like loaded and had a chance to be like really good. And then COVID hit and, and that changed things. And that set us back a little bit. And we still, you know, won a championship in the COVID season, but 21 and 22 felt different. And, um, I really felt like the 23 season was the first time that I felt like a football coach again. And we got back to the basics. We got back to just being able to be present in each other's lives and invest in one another. And, and that's why I think we had the success that we had this past year. It was, I can't tell you how many injuries we had. Or it was just like one thing after another, but our guys didn't flinch. We just locked in, man. And I really felt when after this season at Tiffin, I felt like we I was like really super comfortable as a program. It was running itself and and, and we had, it was going to be sustainable for a long time. And I felt like God was like, all right, man, now it's time. And, and now we're going to get you uncomfortable. We're going to have, have you go chase this thing and knock you off the perch a little bit and balance things out. And so. I think that's why I was led to Garner Webb. That's why I have the opportunity I have. And uh, I definitely think it was a God thing. And I'm honored to be there. Coach, what do you think is the most, the hardest part taking over a new job? What, what If somebody's maybe in their first 100 days and they're going to get into this, they've never better, maybe even been a head coach before. What's going to, at the high school level, college level, whatever, what are some of the biggest challenges that you think you're going to face or you're going to see or you have seen? Yeah, honestly, I, I think I, I think it's just, I think one of the challenges you face is self-doubt. I think just like knowing you have a plan and, and trust in that. When there's so many things that are going to come across your, your desk, right, in those first 30, 60, 90 days that you didn't know were going to happen. And then you're going to be like, oh, shoot, am I on the right track? And I think it's the ability to like reflect and also to gauge insight from people you trust and say, hey, this is the path I'm on. I'm good. This is how would you handle this? And you keep chugging along and, and you really just step into the fear each day. And I know it's it's hard to think about it that way. But to me, that's just that's what it looks like. There's times where it's you have a chance to maybe doubt it, but you just keep pressing forward. And I've learned that you just have to trust yourself. And you have to believe in your vision. And you have to be steadfast in that. And you just have to keep moving forward. And you're going to have setbacks, but you have to remember that at the end of the day, like the first 30 days, three years from now, nobody's going to remember, right? It's about laying the foundations and the groundwork in the short term and maybe having to upset the apple cart a little bit. But in the long term, you're going to get your processes. You're going to get the right people in place. You're going to get the right things laid in. And you're going to lay the foundation for sustainable success. And I think like when coaches take new jobs, like to me, it's out. I want to build a program. I'm not trying to build a team. Like I want to build, like when I was at Tiffin, I want Tiffin to be amazing 40 years from now. And whether I'm here or not, I want to be a part of 
sustainability as a program to build a really healthy program that whether I'm there or not, it's going to win. And I genuinely believe that. And so I had never had any intention to leave there. Like we just keep working and you keep grinding out and then things happen. But at Garner Webb, it's the same thing where it's like, all I want to do is build a program where there's organizational health. There's alignment between president, administration, athletic director, head football coach, and their vision is one that I'm following, I'm aligned with, and I'm, I'm, I'm following their vision. And that allows us to be sustainable as an organization. We're creating right, the structures and the processes that we can hold accountable. One of the things that I really believe in is if you're going to hold guys accountable, then you have to be super black and white and clear with what it is that you're going to hold them accountable to. There's got to be a thought process behind it all. And so just trying to be in, in the forefront of sustainability and trying to build programs and not get swept up and, hey, I got to go take 8,000 transfers to be good in year one, but in year two, it's going to be a disaster. To me, it's let's just focus on being good as a program, getting healthy, coming together, getting everybody going in the same direction, create alignment, and then the chips will fall as they fall. And I think like in our situation at Garner Webb, and I'm juiced about what we're going to do in year one and year two and year three. One, but I feel like we've always made each decision with a mind on the future and not just on the now. It's got to be where your feet are. It took me, I, I remember you, we talk about clinics and our clinics coming up this weekend and the coaches clinic is coming up a couple of weeks here. I is that young guy and the old guys say, be where your feet are. And you're like, I don't want to be where my feet are. You know what I mean? Like I applied to a place that was 30 minutes away from me and I never knew it existed. You know what I mean? I, when I was a younger guy, I was always looking for that next job or at least it was in my mind at some point, owned a little space and, it really did take me until I became an older coach until I realized what you said. Like you, you talked about your how are you going to boil everything down into a smaller thing. And I had all these different things in my interview playbook and all that. And just be where you are, do a great job and build your brand. And people will notice and what you said, God and, and opportunities will open up for you. You don't have to have the hundred page plan or materials and you don't have to uh, nobody looks at it anyway yeah you don't you don't have yeah. to be ready for the, but the you, have thing. It. you better have it you better be able to say that's on page 78 you know? yeah you gotta <laughs> have you gotta have some stuff down that's for sure but i'm so far <laughs> removed from that don't ever want to be in it ever again i'm good i'm where my feet are at so I i've it. been that's there I, I was 24 when i took over at north i was that guy right like just hungry and now i feel like for me it's just it's rolling right there's just no other thought of going back or, or changing anything and we we I always said, I said it all the time, and I wish a few of my coaches, my veteran coaches would have corrected me. I was like, oh, winning cures all. And then we win this year, and it does, that is sure as hell not true, right? <laughs> winning does not cure yeah. all. If anything, it brings more problems. But at the end of the day, like, watering where you're at is, like, a huge thing, and I try to tell my kids that now because, like, when you got high school kids that are going on Twitter and seeing all these transfer portal guys, right, like, now it's becoming a problem in the high school area. And it's starting to leak into different areas. And there's new rule. There's rules that other uh, schools are figuring out about failing school districts, right? Like they're able to transfer from those to a different school that's a successful one in high school. And it's, it's just crazy. And that's what I try to preach to my kids is just water your feet and water the grass that's under your feet right now. And, and it's going to be green. And it's going to grow. And that's the, the model we took. And, and we've done a great job in four years now and, and setting records and things like that at the school history and being a first home playoff game ever as a city school. It's, and that's just an interesting thing. Cause that's exactly how I, I, I look at it now is my first two years. I'm like, Oh my gosh, this place is crazy. I can't get this done. Can't get that done. Can't do this. And it was just felt like every day was just punching you in the gut. Like when you're losing and, and everything like that. And then you see it all come together. And you're still getting punched in the gut, so you just keep pushing. Donnie, go ahead. I know you got a question, Donnie. Well, We've been trying to take it up. I was. This is a, a fan question from a really loyal fan on Twitter, Brian Costa. But I think you answer this to some extent, and I think I know the answer. His question was, "What is your approach to getting players to be all in?" But I think you talked about it. It's it's really about being genuine to who you are, right? You can have these plans, you can have this process, but if you're not genuine, I think. When you talk about how you go to a team meeting, you could go up with some raw pump speech, but that's not what that's not who you are. That's not the genuine you. Yeah, I think be who you are and meet them where they're at. Don't assume they're somewhere that they're not. And I, I think just evaluating and reading the room and reading the situation and understanding what was the culture and what the players need and whatever it is that they need 
find a way to give it to them. It's like I'm doing meetings with all my guys, sit down one-on-ones with every single guy in our program. And I always end it with, what do you need from me? How can I help you? You know, and is there anything that I'm not giving you? Is there anything that, you know, that you need me to, uh, to help with, whether it's, Hey, we need more footballs to throw with, or Hey coach, like I'm struggling with X. Can you help me here? Got you. And so, um, I just think trying to be thoughtful about like being available to them and allowing them to know that you really do care about them. And that's why, like we all coach, that's why we should coach. Like, that's why I coach. Like, I, like I'm not really good at anything other than coaching football. So, like, I, I don't know what else I would do. But I've always, I think I'm good at coaching football. And so that's my way to impact people. And so I've always looked at it that way. We're going to use football as a vehicle to build men. And if you're not going to use football in that way, then why are we coaching? And so yeah. let's use football as a vehicle to build habits and skills and allow guys to become best versions of themselves and everything it is that they want to do. Help them become great husbands and dads and leaders in the community. And then if they all do that, they strive to be that, then I bet you win a lot of games. And if not, you just didn't recruit very well, at least at my level. And so that's that's the way that I've always looked at it. Like, it can't be just about winning. It has to be about the player. It has to be about holistically them getting what they need to be their best. And if they know that you really genuinely care about them improving in every aspect of your life, then they're going to they're gonna buy in as fast as humanly possible. But if it's phony and they know that, then they ain't going to buy in. And honestly, they probably shouldn't anyway. <laughs> And what I wanted to ask about coaches, obviously you got to get coaches to come with you, right? You have to get your coaches in, the guys that trust in your system and and what your beliefs are and your culture. What does the process look like for you from coming from Tiffin and now going to Gardner-Webb? What's that process look like when you're hiring coaches? Yeah, it's funny when you become a head coach, you're always like, man, is anybody going to come with me? And you have that, you have that little twin. Oh man, I wonder if I'm going to get anybody that will come coach for me. And, and it's like, all right, this is cool. I got some great guys that I've been fortunate, man. I have so many great guys that I've worked with and, and that I've had a chance to serve with. And I was able to bring a bunch of guys from Tiffin with me, a bunch of guys that I coached against, had connections with. Every single guy on my staff is somebody I have a personal story with. And, and it's guys that I genuinely trust. It's guys that I genuinely love and appreciate. And it's when I look at coaches, man, like one, I think as, a, as an assistant coach, there's a couple of things that matter. One, you got to be a tremendous dude, right? You got to be a great role model, a mentor, a good husband, a good dad, a good friend, a good son. Like that matters to me. I want our players to, to witness that and to see that. And then I think the things that I care about is a guy that's going to elevate the level of effort of his players, a guy that's going to elevate the level of, of energy of his players and a guy that's going to elevate the level of production of his players. And typically you do that by one, being a tremendous teacher two being a tremendous relationship builder and three, being a guy that's truly invested in everything about your players. And so I really look at it that way. I'm not worried about the scheme. I'm not worried about, are you a three, four coach? Are you a four, three coach? Do you play press quarters? Do you play quarters? Do you play cover three? Are you a three match team? Like everybody gets inundated with scheme and it's in all sincerity to build a scheme that fits your team, not a team that fits your scheme. When we all have to be flexible and versatile enough to figure out what we have and then find a way to, innovate and supplement and make sure that you have a scheme that fits your people. And so that's why I think schemes a little bit over talked about when you're hiring guys, where I think it's about people when you hire great people and you fit scheme around that and everything else falls into place. Well, coach, man, I just want to say, we appreciate you coming on. You got three new fans of the, was it the running bulldogs? Is that the running name? Bulldogs, baby. Running bulldogs. bulldogs, three new fans. We're going to be watching you. <laughs> Uh, Three new we, fans. I've been a fan of Coach Reiser since the day that I left ODU too. So, and I, ha- I I've been a fan of Coach Reiser. But I'm saying he, he's suck. got yeah, just two of you. Then he's got three I, new. I can't read, but you can't add. Three new yeah. running bulldogs. You weren't a running bulldog till just now. All right, no, all right, dogs, baby. Good. That's so, all me. All right, Great. let's wrap this thing up because Coach is a busy man, and he's day two, day three in his house. He's got things to do. Donnie Mac, go ahead. You wrap it up today because at the end of the day, you haven't talked that much. I would love to hear your voice, Donnie. Wrap (laughs) us up. Coach, we really appreciate you being on. We wish you luck going forward with the future of your program. Again, we want to remind everybody, clinic this Saturday, Coach Stout has put in a ton of work. So I'll publicly say, Coach Stout, thank you for – Everything you've done getting this together, we're really excited. I don't what what's the total number up to right now? Is that something we want to talk about publicly? Or I think if around? everybody shows up, including the speakers, right now we're around uh, seventy five, and some different guys have said they're going to tune in and things. I'm interested in, in seeing uh, walk ups are welcome. We want as many of you that can come. 
If you pre-register, it helps us figure out our resource standpoint, but I think we're going to have a really, we got a great venue. We got a great thing going. We got a great social lined up, great topics. I think we're going to have a really great free clinic that you're going to have a great mm-hmm. time at. So bring your staff. That's yeah. BYOB. Bring your own beer. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, it is, Ryan. Uh, as Sarah said, but again, thank you all for tuning in. Make sure you subscribe on YouTube, the 614 Headsets YouTube channel. You can find us on Spotify and Apple Podcasts as well. If you prefer to listen, follow us on Twitter. You can go interact with us there. Give us any good topics, good questions that you got. But for Coach Sayers, Coach Stout, and Coach Reiser, have a good night. Thanks.